two members of the label of the Labour Party are also slated to join the government. And um, the Knesset speaker, which was also, it's, it's an entire different discussion, will be a member of Likud. Um, the government may have its first um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, Ethiopian immigrant who will serve as a minister for the first time in Israel's history. They may have the first Arab minister who is serving uh, for the first time in over a decade. And this government, if it does work out, um, may bring some stability to Israel. Now, as far as costs, people are saying that uh, the 34 ministers are extremely expensive. Now, just for the sake of comparison, the new ministers, the 34 ministers will cost about 330 million shekels. Uh, divide that by 3.5 if you want to get it in dollars. But a fourth round of elections will cost Israel about a billion shekels. So while it's very expensive, it's still uh, cheaper. Um, now, how do we tie this in with coronavirus? Coronavirus hit Israel uh, before it hit the US. It hit Israel hard. It sent everybody in a lockdown from about 30,000 um, unemployed, a very low unemployment rate in the country. We have about 1.1 million unemployed in Israel now. Uh, we seem to be after, we seem to, we're way ahead of America as far as dealing with the pandemic. We're essentially after it. Um, there are way more recovered, about 9, 000, over 9,000 people have recovered. There are 6,000 that are still sick. Most of them are in a mild condition. Um, and there are less than 100 people on ventilators, which is that's a key number. There were only 23, 23 new registered patients in the past 24 hours. So Israel is now discussing uh, opening the beaches. Schools have opened a bit, uh, grades one and three and 12 and 13. Uh, more uh, classes will be admitted next week. They're talking about opening the malls and basically opening everything back, uh, trying to bring everything back to normal as far as normal as possible. You still have to walk around with a mask on your face. Um, so, Basically, just to sum up, after 18 months, Israel still doesn't know where it is politically. The turmoil is still here. We, we thought we were going to have a government, but we still have two and a half weeks of uh, uh, insanity, uh, political drama. Every day is very exciting in Israel. And... Um, It's basically until, uh, until it's over, it's not over. The court ha has to decide if Netanyahu can serve as a prime minister. The court has to decide on, its, on the legality of the coalition agreement. And if the agreement, if, if the, uh, both Blue and White and Likud have threatened that if the court rules that the coalition agreement is illegal or unconstitutional, they will go to elections. Israel will face its, face its fourth round of elections in a, a bit over a year. And that's not good. At a situation where you have 1.1 million unemployed and the economy is trying to get back on its feet and who knows what we're facing vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran and the ICC, Dan mentioned, and we've got loads of issues on our plate. And while the country is seeking stability, and the majority are interested in this unity government, which will bring a, a measure of stability to the country, we still don't know what the end of the story is. Um, so that, that, that's basically uh, um, uh, uh, the story right now. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, and We've still got Corona and we've still got the nuclear threat, but 
I, that's kind of the uh, 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 Israeli reality when I uh, read news from other countries. Um, I sometimes envy, I, most of the time I envy other countries because Israel, you know, what, sometimes, you know, you, people talk about uh, uh, an acrimonious Israeli public and people are pushy on lines and everybody, you know, tries to jump ahead and nobody's polite. But when you take a step back and you think of the Israeli reality, I mean, I'm not, I don't say push on the line when you're in Israel, but you can kind of understand people. We, it's an insane country. We've constantly living under a nuclear threat and you've got the PA and you've got Gaza and you've got Lebanon and you've got Hezbollah and you've got an unstable government and you've got Corona to boot. So people are just crazy. That's just the way it is. Uh, so that's, that's basically my rundown. If anybody has questions, I'm more than happy to answer about. Thanks. Anything. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to kick off the questions. Uh, that was very informative. You didn't mention much about extending sovereignty, given the agreement, which says that after July 1st, that's one thing that is controversial, that can be undertaken, assuming the new government is created. You want to tell us how likely it is that the political ducks will align and basically what we can expect after July 1st? Okay, uh, so the coalition agreement does call for the uh, um, uh, sovereignty, the declaration of sovereignty in parts of Judea and Samaria as uh, um, described by the deal of the century, a uh, peace plan, peace plan um, formulated by the Trump administration. However, the wording of the uh, coalition agreement is very sketchy and it leaves everything kind of open-ended. And although they can commence um, stages for uh, a moving towards sovereignty from July 1st, it's very, very open-ended. And it depends on so many things. Blue and White is not happy about it. And for instance, there's, there's a clause within the coalition agreement which says in kind of a, 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 an unclear fashion that if it creates a diplomatic turmoil, then they won't move forward with it. So what does diplomatic turmoil mean? Does it mean France is unhappy with it? They're unhappy with it. They're expected to be unhappy with it. Does that mean Germany won't support it? They've already announced they won't support it. Does that mean that the Palestinian Authority will not be happy with it? Well, that's to be expected. So what does diplomatic uh, 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 upheaval mean? It's unclear. So uh, while it seems that the, uh, the, the agreement was basically meant to appease both sides, um, Netanyahu appears to be interested in announcing and declaring sovereignty. Gantz is very hesitant about it. So I can't tell you what's gonna happen in Israel uh, uh, next, next uh, uh, tomorrow as far as politics. Um, the, I can just say basically that there's an option for uh, uh, a, a declaration of sovereignty. And again, it's important to remember, it's not in all areas of Judea and Samaria. It's only in areas that the Trump government agrees to. So that, that's already a step back. And then it's up to basically developments like many other things in Israel, it appears they'll be playing it by ear. We have a number of questions about the Supreme Court and their role in elections. So we have, I'll just paraphrase the three of them from Howard uh, Gluckman, uh, from Len Getz, and from Susan Rosenbluth. Uh, the first question was, why is the Supreme Court involved at all? The next question is, is there any mechanism for the Knesset to override a Supreme Court decision? And the third one is, is possibly the Supreme Court overreaching, and could this be the catalyst that drives the Knesset and the Israeli body politic to take control of the Supreme Court in a different way if they force elections when the public doesn't want it? Okay, excellent and very complex questions. Um, is the court overstepping, overstepping its jurisdiction? 
Uh, according to the Netanyahu government and blue and white, they are. So I'll wait, I'll, 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 I'll step out, I'll, I'll roll back a bit. Uh, the court in Israel, the High Court of Justice in Israel is very powerful. Um, and it advocates its own uh, activism. Um, and it's been extremely active in shaping Israel's political, religious, and diplomatic scene. Uh, many say that it's definitely overreaching its jurisdiction and its ruling on issues it shouldn't be. It's in Israel, uh, just, just in the state, in the states, uh, the uh, members of uh, the, the members of the courts are voted into office or nominated by the administration. In Israel, you have um, an almost secret committee that convenes. It's got members, it's got politicians, uh, actual members of the court and lawyers and various other functionaries who get together and nominate these judges. Uh, the protocols are secret, believe it or not, so you don't know how these judges were actually chosen. Uh, many of these judges are friends, relatives, They've worked for each other. They've all gone to school together, and they all come very from a very specific uh, political stream. Unfortunately, uh, every once in a while, uh, they get somebody wrong into the room. Somehow, you know, somebody from the right wing uh, uh, manages to slip in, but the most are from the left wing of the political uh, uh, from the political spectrum. Uh, and their views are well known up to the uh, point where you can guess. If you give me a question and then you tell me who's on the panel, I can, uh, not me, but there are people, you, you can definitely guess which way it's going to go and you're usually accurate because these people's views are known. Uh, they've, some of them are, uh, they, they, they've uh, viewed, uh, they, they uh, uh, um, voice their opinions publicly. Uh, after uh, after uh, several uh, 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 court rulings, you can know where they're going. Um, so they're definitely, and, and in this case, uh, the eight left-wing uh, organizations brought the petitions to the court, so, so the court needs to hear them. They didn't throw them out like some said they should. They decided to hear them. How they were ruled, that, that's a big problem. That These 11 people may send Israel to a fourth round of elections. Second question, can the government somehow annul their ruling? So they're working on that right now. They're working uh, to enshrine within law uh, the ability for a, a, a Knesset majority to annul a, court, a high court's jurisdiction. And it is currently not law. And it's, and it's a contentious point, but uh, it's something on the table. Uh, and the third question was? It was just, how did they get involved at all in so as, as I was saying, be, there, I think you may have already answered that. Right, the court in Israel is very active. Uh, they rule on everything. Just the other day, um, just it was, they ruled uh, that Hospitals in Israel on Passover cannot ban people from bringing uh, chametz into hospitals. Now it's 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 kind of like been an accepted, I wouldn't say tradition, but an accepted public norm that during Pesach, in public spheres, you don't bring your chametz at home. You do what you want. And in, uh, in recent years. Um, Organizations who are not interested in Israel's Jewish uh, uh, identity, the state's Jewish identities, have been fighting uh, uh, this on various planes. They've also been uh, fighting uh, Israel's uh, observance of the Shabbos in the public uh, uh, sphere. And so the court, court ruled, basically they ruled against uh, a public norm that, that was kind of like uh, uh, acceptable uh, in, in Israeli society. And that's influ influencing Israel's identity as a Jewish state. Should yes. they be doing that? In my opinion, no. But they're doing it. Yes. So let me get to some other questions. Um, Steve Feldman asked, what are the chances 
Israel will again try direct elections of a PM, will the threshold be increased to get into the Knesset? And maybe the larger question, as a result of these three and possibly four elections, are people as a consensus emerging about any better way to do things? I don't think the direct election is gonna really work because it's been tried. So, so here, here, here you've got a bizarre situation where um, the politicians are playing with the political system to suit their needs. If they believe that smaller parties are fracturing the political scene to the extent where they can't form a government, uh, they raise the threshold and then that uh, requires bigger political parties, uh, but then some of their political part, then some of their political, potential political part partners don't meet the, thre the threshold and they don't, um, uh, then they can't form a coalition. Uh, we've already had uh, direct elections for prime minister and it didn't work because what you had is you had a prime minister who couldn't create a coalition. Uh, people were voting right for the prime minister or and left wing for the party or vice versa. So it again created instability. Um, various think tanks and politicians have put forward various uh, different uh, ways of uh, uh, having elections in Israel, possibly breaking down the countries into areas, sort of like the way uh, uh, the US has uh, the states and the electoral college and so on and so forth. Um, but so far, there's so much instability, I don't see them, I don't see the government making a real uh, change to the uh, way we vote in the government so far. Okay, we have a question from uh, Ken Moskowitz. Please explain the ICC decision. Israel does not recognize or submit to its jurisdiction. And according to the Treaty of Montevideo in 38, the PA is not a state. Right. So we have, um, just a quick recap, we have uh, the PA, which is not a country, the state of Palestine, as it does not exist as a political entity. Uh, it was, uh, uh, it did join the ICC in 2012, I believe, um, but it is not internationally recognized as a state, and Israel is not a member of the Rome Protocol, which established the ICC. So taking in mind these two crucial points, um, the Palestinian Authority submitted several complaints against Israel, Israel argued that the ICC cannot, does not have the jurisdiction to rule on these complaints. We're not talking about the content yet. We're talking about the legality of these, uh, of the, the ICC's uh, uh, ability, legal ability to rule on these issues. However, uh, ICC Chief Prosecutor Ben Suda, who has uh, uh, basically been chasing Israel for a year in various forums, uh, still uh, maintains that the ICC does have the ability to rule on these issues. Many countries, the US, Hungary, Germany, Australia, and several other countries have submitted their legal opinion that the ICC cannot rule on these issues because uh, the Palestinian Authority is not uh, a, a political entity that could uh, uh, serve as a player within the ICC. Uh, this is a news from the past week, from the past weekend, in fact. Um, um, ben Suda announced uh, in, on Friday that she still maintains that the court has jurisdiction. Israel again rejected her, uh, her opinion and said that she was seeking to tarnish Israel's name and fight Israel in the public realm. So this is all uh, new and developing. Israel has previously uh, faced several such um, uh, courts. There's a gold, uh, the gold, the Goldstein report, and there were several other uh, 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 attempts by the ICC to uh, probe Israel. They've all failed so far. Uh, so this is a new uh, and developing story, and uh, stay tuned for yet more excitement from Israel. 
Yes, uh, just to add my two cents, uh, the uh, normal definition of a state is controlling territory, which the PA does not do, and being properly internationally recognized. So they don't meet either of the standard criteria. We're going to now go, uh, Eugene Greenstein has a question, if we can unmute his uh, microphone, please. Eugene? <coughs> It seems that the Supreme Court is more power than the Prime Minister and the Knesset, and they're unelected and accountable to no one. You sort of imply that. Could you be a little bit more explicit about how powerful the Supreme Court is, and why bother with the Knesset and the Prime Minister? Okay, so Chief Justice Aaron Barak, who's no longer serving uh, on, on the court, uh, coined the phrase, um, uh, he talked about uh, 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 um, judicial activism. He talked about the court being active and shaping uh, Israel's image as a Jewish and democratic country. Uh, he claimed that the court, um, as it was structured, has this ability. Um, many commentators and legal authorities say the court does not. Israel, uh, the, the coalition, mostly the right wing, is now working on various laws to curb, to, to curb the high court's uh, uh, ability to rule on these issues, uh, possibly redefining its role, uh, enshrining within, rule, within law what exactly it can discuss and what exactly it cannot discuss. Uh, right now, it, it appears, in my opinion, this is, you know, everything in Israel is split down the middle. Either you're on the right wing or you're on the left. If you're on the left, then you're pro uh, the court. If you're on the right, you're, de you're usually against the court's rulings because they're usually uh, against Israel's Jewish character. They clearly state that when it comes to Israel's Jewish and democratic character, they put a bigger emphasis on its democratic character rather than its Jewish character. Uh, I personally believe that the Jewish state should have more of a Jewish character. Um, and because they come from a very specific uh, side of the political spectrum and from, and they're all friends and so on and so forth, Israel has a serious problem here. And they've assumed so much power that yes, they may be able to rule that Israel's elected prime minister, you got to keep in mind, two and a half million people voted for Netanyahu. And uh, hundreds of thousands of others voted for Gantz, for Benjamin Gantz, the head of the Blue and White Party. So together you've got a, a, major, a vast majority of Israeli citizens who are interested in seeing Netanyahu stay in power. And yet an 11 judge panel may come and rule that he can't, and that's definitely undemocratic. And the, uh, the right wing, the right wing parties are now trying to curb the court, uh, the high court of justice's powers. Uh, will they be able to garner uh, the support? Will they be able to move ahead with these uh, uh, um, laws? It's up in the air. I think we have time for one more question. I'm gonna read it from Dave Goodman. Uh, he wrote, why does Israel allow the U.S. to dictate whether or not Israel applies its law in Judea and Samaria? And I, I think the answer is that's just the reality. But maybe you can expound upon the dependency and the codependency between Israel and the United States. It's something that's near and dear to my own efforts in Washington. Um, well, I'll start and then uh, maybe you'll, you'll add. Uh, so for... Israel's um, declaration of sovereignty to be successful in Judea and Samaria, it needs international recognition. And therefore, uh, uh, we're, that's, that's why Israel is looking for uh, the US's support. If Israel goes ahead on its own and declares sovereignty in Judea and Samaria, it will face problems in the UN in the UN uh, a Security Council, it will face uh, sanctions, resolutions, but if a big power like the US um, get, lends its support, it has veto power 
all across the board. So Israel can move ahead successfully with this declaration and survive it. Now, just one point, uh, the question said, why does Israel allow the U.S. to dictate its uh, um, political and diplomatic developments? So it's important to understand that this deal of the century, uh, this deal of the century was developed and formulated together with the Israelis. Uh, I understand that there's a deep Israeli involvement in formulating the borders. Um, Netanyahu has been on tour together with um, U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. Friedman. They've been together in the rain, in the mud, in Samaria. I saw footage and photos of them touring the area together. So there, there it's not really, it, it, there is a, 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 a level of uh, U.S. dictating Israel's policy, but there's also a lot of close work here together. And Israel understands that while it is an emerging superpower in many realms, it's still not powerful enough to stand on its own and dictate its own policy. And it needs a strong friend like the U.S. to give it a, a, a backing in the diplomatic realm. And therefore, they're working together. Yeah, that was perfect. I don't have anything to add. But I think we do have one more question that's so good that we can't pass up on it from Meyer Herzl Melmod. What do you make of the pro-Israel comments, TV, et cetera, from Arab countries? That could be a whole program, but if you have just a couple of minutes to comment yeah. on that. Yeah, uh, it's unbelievable. It really is unbelievable. Um, I'll, I'll talk about this, the, the, the Arab street, and then I'll talk about Arab governments. The Arab street, it's really unbelievable. Uh, at the end of the day, a good part uh, the Arab world, thanks to social media, Israel's got an extreme, and this is again an, an entire lecture, Israel's got a very strong social media um, department within the foreign ministry, it's got a page in Arabic, it's got dedicated pages for each country, it's got a page in Farsi, and it, um, it's got uh, hundreds of thousands of followers throughout the Middle East, and it's got uh, millions of shares. Uh, I don't have the exact stats in front of me, but it's really uh, uh, unbelievable um, numbers. And just for the sake of uh, one example, um, uh, uh, Iran is facing, still facing, a serious water crisis. So what Israel has been doing is uh, publishing uh, on social media ways to save water in Farsi. Just another example. Uh, Israel has translated its uh, COVID-19 guidelines for health and safety. Uh, they translated them into Arabic, and they've been publishing it through that, through the, uh, throughout the Palestinian Authority. Now, people are able to see through the lies. They're able to see that um, the life in Israel is good. They're able to see that Israeli uh, Arabs living in Israel with uh, 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 Israeli citizenship, live well, have good lives, can do what they want, they have the freedom of worship, they can get a, 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 any education they want, they're on the courts, they're in the army, they hold high offices, unlike their own countries where they're basically oppressed by uh, one dictator after the other. And they're able to see that Israel exports technology and provides aid to countries, so they support Israel, and the, the, these shows of support, are, uh, uh, they're genuine and they're amazing. Now, as far as governments are concerned, um, there are, there's uh, the uh, Sunni, I'm not gonna get into the whole Shiite Sunni schism uh, within uh, the Middle East, but there are Sunni governments uh, who oppose Iran, which is a Shiite government. Uh, we're going back, uh, this is a history of Islam, which is, yet another lecture, um, but uh, um, they're basically aligning with Israel against Iran and understanding that Israel has technology that they can't even dream of developing and intelligence abilities and uh, diplomatic ties. So secretly, they're working with Israel. And for years now, I've been hearing off the grid reports of, of pretty close collaboration between uh, Arab states and Israel. 
And that's, that's uh, Netanyahu discusses several times. He'll never name names, but he'll say that these ties exist. And uh, uh, um, after 70 years, it appears that there is a definite change within the Middle East. Uh, uh, governments are uh, changing their approach to Israel. And who knows? We'll have to leave it there, I think. Have a peace. All right, thanks. I think that's right. But there are also some, some negative signs. There's a uh, Egyptian TV program over Ramadan where right. science fiction and they're fantasizing that Israel is destroyed. So there's right. some of the there same. A lot of, uh, I want to be negative. I'll say, I'll say that despite the traditional anti Israel sentiments and despite uh, the Muslim anti Semitism uh, and the uh, Nazi variation anti Semitism, there is still, despite all this, which is usually prevalent on the street, there are still positive uh, yes. uh, attitudes toward Israel. And we want to be looking at the positive. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much. I want to now Thanks go to uh, uh, Hannah Oz, who's the uh, assistant to the CEO of your organization, TPS. And she wants to say a few words, and then I'll close up. Thank Hannah? you so much. Thank you so much. I first want to say on behalf of TPS, Israel's news agency, a huge thanks to the DOA, to Alan, to Natalie, and to Dan. Thank you so much. To my colleague, Arya Savir of TPS, for sharing um, his wealth of knowledge with us. I wanted to tell you um, very briefly about TPS and then share with you a personal story. Uh, TPS is Israel's news agency around the world. Uh, over 80% of the news you read in the world section comes from news agencies. The ones you may know the best are Associated Press, Reuters, and AFP. TPS uh, wants to take the media bias problem and solve it at the source. Instead of fixing the news, TPS is the news. We are on the scene with the help of our staff like Arya and 300 volunteers across the country. And now I get to my story. I'm a mother of four. I live in Modi'in, which is kind of a suburbia between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And I, I help the CEO with many things. I work on grants. I help organize programs like this. And um, I heard an alert. And there was, a, there was a terror attack. And for the first time, I was the one closest. So I grabbed the battery pack for my cell phone and I jumped in my car and I started driving and I was getting, um, it was initial report. So first I started heading one way, and then I started heading another way. And then I pulled over to the side of the road and I thought I had wasted so much time and I ran as fast as I could and I got to the scene. I started taking pictures. I started listening. And what I heard was a 14 year old um, Arab terrorist had stabbed a woman. Luckily, she ended up um, recovering well. And soldiers that happened to be passing by saw him, shot in the air, and captured him. We got the story right. We, we got the pictures. I thought, my pictures will probably come out after other people's pictures. I wasn't paying attention to what was happening. I was taking the pictures and sending them in to our office. Then, as time went on, I had a little more time, I started looking. No one was coming. Had they all been there and then they'd left? And then I understood, no one else covered this terror attack. If TPS hadn't been there, there would have been no pictures. There would have been no story, and there would have not had the accurate information from the scene. And this was the first time, although this happens all the time for TPS, that I could be involved. And to be honest, uh, it was very emotional for me to feel like I was making a difference. And I think that's a feeling that our 300 volunteers share. Arya himself has often been the first at a terror attack. So he is also, although a lot of times he's writing, we all, we all take our turns when we need to. So um, I am very excited to introduce TPS, Israel's news agency, to some of you. And I'm excited to update those of you who have known about us um, for weeks, months, or years. And again, thank you so much to the ZOA, and we look forward to being um, in touch with you. And um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you to TPS and thank you to you individually and to Aya. I wanted to just make one comment from the things that if, if everyone doesn't read the, uh, the, the group chat, someone said all this talk about things other than the pay to slay policy of the Palestinian Authority, it is uh, in every ZOA event, we have to emphasize that we are actively involved in uh, trying to stop the Arab practice of paying the terrorists who commit these activities with funds from the European Union and until recently from the United States. And we really are committed to, to that as a, as a factor. I wanted to, again, thank everyone for being here, tell you about some of our upcoming programs. Tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern time, the ZOA National President Mort Klein and National Board Chair Mark Levinson will offer insights into the recent election, the title of the program, at the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations. You may be all aware of what occurred, but you'll find out more about it tomorrow night. Uh, ZOA's concerns about Hayes and Hayes's chair becoming chair of the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations, 7 p.m. Our book club series continues this Wednesday and next at 1 p.m. Uh, Liz Burney, ZOA Director of Special Projects, will host authors Dr. Charles Jacobs, and then the following week, uh, Robert Spencer. On May 12th, Lagba Omer join us for a very special program featuring from Jerusalem, Ziv Ornstein and Ir David, and there is much more. Stay tuned to ZOA emails, check our website and Facebook pages. On May 14th, ZOA Michigan Regional Director Kobe Ertz will bring us up to date on the Israeli government uh, coalition status. And on May 18th, I told you already, uh, I think we have the time at either 7 or 7.30 p.m. on that Monday night. Uh, I will be uh, the webinar along with Alan Jay. So these are strange and difficult times. If you enjoyed today's program and all of our ZOA virtual programming, and if you have the ability, please go to zoa.org, find the Donate Now button, and consider supporting our work. We are a nonprofit and it is appreciated. So again, with that, we'll end it. Thank you all for your time. Thank you to TPS and we'll see you next time. Thank you.